Thank you everybody uh, and thanks for coming today to hear about sustainable urban water systems. Um, I promise you that the um, advertised title is the last adolescent play on words I hope we're going to hear this afternoon. Um, but I hope that you'll still hang around to hear about um, water systems in cities. So like any, I'm a lecturer in environmental engineering and anybody who gives an environmental lecture has to, it's compulsory to start with telling everybody how bad the world is. Um, so I am going to spend a short amount of time telling you about um, the crises that we're currently facing in terms of water globally and what that might mean in different parts of the world. I'm then going to go on and make the possibly slightly controversial um, claim that our models of current water infrastructure provision around the world are in many ways fundamentally unsustainable. And there are two key pieces of evidence for that. One is the overconsumption of water resources in developed economies in cities like London. The other is the um, lack of affordability um, of those systems in order to provide water to the poorest people in rapidly urbanising uh, cities in Asia, Africa and other parts of the world. And then I'm going to go on and look at some initial alternative models for water infrastructure provision. And those are based on providing water at multiple scales. So rather than just having one large centralised infrastructure system, looking at having water systems that operate across a range of different scales. And what's really important there is that we're not just talking about the technology of water treatment or water distribution. We're talking about also having institutions and businesses and regulation to match the different scales of provision. So the problem with water in cities is both a problem of too much water, like we see with flooding, and too much dirty wastewater, which we have to get rid of, um, and the problem of too little water. So there are the problem of people living in rapidly urbanising cities not having access to clean drinking water. Uh, and also um, increasing water stress and water scarcity in many cities around the world uh, as rainfall becomes more erratic and droughts become more prolonged um, and intense. So we know, the one thing that we know about climate change is that, is, that, that climate change is going to make these problems of both too much water in our cities and too little water even more difficult to manage. I think although my talk today is focused on urban water systems, it is important to put it into the context of global water use and global consumption. And the figure varies. Um, some say 70. This data says about 82% of global water resources are consumed in agriculture. <coughs> So we should remember that actually our biggest consumption of water in cities comes through the food that we eat and the clothes that we wear. So notwithstanding that, that relatively small amount of global water resources that are consumed in cities is incredibly critical because that's what um, underpins basic public health in cities. And it's also criti critical from the perspective of whilst we can move food and fibre around the world in our global trading systems, we can't move our cities so well, nor can we directly move the water to the cities. So this problem of urban water supply is a very localised problem. And whilst on a global scale, cities might not consume much water, on a local area, they can have a big impact on their local water resources. And we can see that on this map of water stress. So there, again, there are various ways of measuring um, stress and scarcity of water. Uh, this one is very simple, takes a very simple account of how much water is available and how much is withdrawn. And so we see the kind of classic North Africa, Asia countries, southeast of Australia, where we might expect that water, all those red areas, is where more water is being withdrawn from the environment than is being replenished by rainfall and natural means. So we see the kind of usual suspects there, but you might also note up there a little red dot in the north of Europe being the southeast of England. So we are actually in a globally recognised water scarce region here in that our cities, basically London, is abstracting more water or requiring more water from our local rivers and groundwater supplies than can be sustained over the long term. 
The other problem, apart from the, you know, actual amount of water that's available, is who has access to that water. And this is one of, I think, the greatest shames and greatest challenges of modern global society is the number of people who still don't have basic access to water and sanitation in the world today. And when we're talking about basic access to water and sanitation, we're not talking about the kind of level of access that I enjoy, whereby in my one bedroom flat, I have seven water points within fall, you know, falling over distance. So I have taps in my, kit, in my kitchen, several taps in my bathroom. This level of access is an, a level of access of 20 litres per person per day within one kilometre of the home. So it's a fairly low bar that we're looking to, um, to get people over in terms of this access to basic drinking water. Uh, and back in the year 2000, the United Nations set a series of Millennium Development Goals, two of which related to water and sanitation. And the goal was, or the goals were, to reduce by half the proportion of people who don't have access to either water or sanitation by the year 2015 not that far off, it was set from a 1990 baseline. So at around the turn of the millennium, there were still 21% of people in developing countries who didn't have access within one kilometre to 20 litres of water per person per day. The situation with sanitation is even worse. So at around the turn of the century, um, there were more than half of, the world, half of the population in developing countries didn't have access to safe sanitation. Once again, this bar is not particularly high. We're not talking about giving everybody a flushing toilet. We're talking about basic pit latrines, improved latrines, basic technology. In 2009, um, so the 2009 update on the Millennium Development Goals showed that things are actually heading in the right direction in terms of water. But shamefully, we still have nearly a billion people who don't have access um, to safe drinking water. Sanitation is truly shameful, that's really not heading anywhere fast, and we still have in the world two, two and a half billion people who don't have access to sanitation. Clearly that has big impacts on public health, but it also has big impacts on basic human rights and basic kind of human dignity. On the other end of the spectrum, so we're failing to deliver water and sanitation to billions of people in the world. But on the other end of the spectrum, in developed countries, um, and thinking about that, you know, there were many of those water stressed regions were in the US, Australia, um, Europe, the UK. The levels of consumption in those countries, remember that 20 litres per person per day, which is what the World Health Organisation says we need um, in order to meet our basic hygiene needs. In the UK, we consume 150 litres per person per day. We're sort of about in the middle of the range. So the, the poor old Americans again win this, you know, league table of shame up with their 360 on that graph, but I saw a figure um, last week which is more like 400. So very um, profligate use of water. So again, we've got this kind of global water crisis of too much on the one hand, you know, too many of us consuming too much water in, you know, amazing inventions like the power shower with 26 nozzles and what other kind of luxury features. And then this problem of people who just still are not getting access to that basic 20 litres per person per day that they need to maintain basic health. So this is clearly not sustainable. Whatever we're doing is not sustainable. Um, and when we look at um, sustainability challenges like climate change, like the water crisis. Um, often we divide ourselves into two camps being a technological fix that somehow we'll just come up with a new way of treating water, a new desalination plant or some amazing new technology that will provide free drinking water to people in poor countries. Or on the other hand it's about social change. We need to change people's attitudes towards water, convince them to use less or we need to change our institutions that deliver water and um, sanitation infrastructure. The truth about sustainability, as we all know, is that it's a bit of both. And so what I'm now going to do over the next few minutes is to show a bit how that technology and society and culture have you know, interacted in this um, urban water systems, 
urban water infrastructure and how the two really shape each other. So when we're talking <coughs> about a fairly conventional approach to water infrastructure, we start with water resources which are often outside the city limits. These are our rivers, groundwater resources, reservoirs, dams. The water then goes through um, reasonably sophisticated treatment processes to make sure that that's clean and suitable for drinking. Then through a, an extensive distribution network in the city and often when we're thinking of infrastructure that's, that might be where we think the infrastructure system ends. But I think it's important that we also think about our households and how we use water as part of that infrastructure, partly because that in many ways is what drives the amount of water that we use and also because that is actually the point at which the system connects to the wastewater infrastructure system which then drains away the dirty water and treats it before um, discharging it back into the environment. So we see in a conventional system it's a fairly linear flow through. Water comes out of the environment through an infrastructure system. We see it for about two seconds in between the tap and the drain in our house and then it goes back through this massive infrastructure system back to the environment. And this infrastructure system in modern cities has very noble aims and has made considerable achievements in improving public health. Um, this very handsome fella here, those um, who are from civil, environmental and geomatic engineering might recognise him. He's the person who our building is named after, that's Edwin Chadwick. Um, and Edwin Chadwick, so he has a few connections to UCL, one of which is that when he was a very young man early in his career, Jeremy Bentham was at the end of his life, Edwin Chadwick served as Jeremy Bentham's personal secretary. He then went on to become, he was not an engineer, he was trained as a barrister, worked as a lawyer, uh, so worked as a lawyer, a journalist, worked for Jeremy Bentham, was a general kind of busybody activist um, around London and England. And he was really focused on the sanitary reform movement. So Chadwick, among others, really pointed out the connection between poor public health, poor access to sanitation, poverty, um, and therefore, you know, social and economic implications for the city. So Chadwick was a very strong sanitary reformer and the kind of model of urban infrastructure that the sanitary reform movement in the 19th century promoted was one that was based on the provision, the continuous supply of clean water to all domestic dwellings and a sanitation system based on water washing away waste from those households. So the other thing to remember is that they were operating under the miasma theory of disease at this point in time. That was a theory that said that disease was caused by bad smell and so it's kind of logical to use water to wash away the smells, um, to get those smells, that disease out of the city as quickly as possible. So we've ended up with, from that kind of basic public health um, motivation for the system, to a water system whereby water is effectively ubiquitous. We don't have to go very far. If you just go up those stairs, you'll find a toilet that has several taps um, and flushing toilets. And we have pipes all over the city bringing this water to us, but those pipes are usually hidden. So the pipes are under our streets or they're hidden within our buildings. So we have water that is everywhere. We turn the tap on and it keeps running continuously, um, but we don't ever see where it comes from. We don't see how it came how it came to be here. So one way to characterise this infrastructure system and to characterise, in fact, other infrastructure systems like energy and transport is this basic idea of predict and provide. So for the last 100, 150 years, our infrastructure services have been based on the idea that demographers, statisticians, others, come up with projections for population, come up with trends, usually growing trends in consumption, and make forecasts as to what demand for water will be. They then hand that over to the engineers who design the infrastructure system to meet that demand. So as demand is predicted to grow, so they grow the reservoirs, the treatment works, etc. And it's been based 
um, essentially on a centralised, well-controlled system to maintain those public health um, standards and goes through this extensive network of distribution. So there are clearly some basic challenges to that. So anybody who has any kind of environmental consciousness will have thought, oh, hold on a second, if water is a limited resource, particularly if it's regionally constrained, this idea that we can just continue to predict expanding demand and then somehow engineer systems to meet that demand is a basic kind of fallacy. And, you know, as we've seen in places like Australia, uh, the Mediterranean, it doesn't matter how, build, how big you build the dam, if there's no rainfall, it doesn't make any more water. Um, so that basic kind of hydrological constraint is important. What's also important, particularly in whether or not we're able to roll this out to developing countries, is that these are very expensive systems. They're expensive um, in terms of capital to set them up or to expand the system, expensive to operate, expensive to maintain. Another key um, driver at the moment for the UK and other water utilities around the world is the carbon emissions from these systems. So water is a very heavy substance. It takes a lot of energy to treat water and to pump it through our, through our cities. And as a rule of thumb, there's a general idea that the, um, in any given city, the water utility will be the biggest customer of the energy utility. Uh, and of course, we've got this problem which we're very familiar with in London of pipes and systems that were built 150 years ago needing to be maintained and renewed. And it is possible that that might provide us with a little moment to go, how might we actually change this system in order to make it more sustainable? So there are these challenges to supply-driven um, expansion of water infrastructure. And so that has led to a focus on demand management. And there are various techniques that are used to try and manage demand for water within cities. Um, one might be in a, the case of a severe or impending water shortage is to just put restrictions on use. So we're familiar with that in terms of a hose pipe ban during um, drought over um, yep, dry summers um, here in London. You might also, you're also familiar, no doubt, with water conservation campaigns. So education campaigns telling us to turn the tap off when we're brushing the teeth, for instance. Um, water efficient appliances, dishwashers, washing machines, making those more efficient in how they use water. Uh, and also, important, certainly importantly in the UK or in England and Wales, is uh, water metering. Uh, so at the moment, only 20% of houses in the UK or in England and Wales have a water meter. So most of us don't even know how much water we're using and we certainly don't pay for how much we use. So once there are water meters in, in place, then there are demand management kind of techniques around or strategies around tariffs to try and convince people to use less water and to use less water at particular times of the year or the day. So there is an effort to look at demand management uh, and an effort to try and change people's behaviour to try and change people's attitudes towards water. But one of my colleagues from the University of Western Sydney, Zoe Safoulis, did a study in the western suburbs of Sydney um, at the beginning, in the, the early years of the drought that most of Australia experienced um, for the first decade of the century. And so she was really looking at how do, she's a cultural researcher, was looking at how do everyday householders in suburban Sydney respond to these um, calls for water conservation? How do they go about saving water in their everyday lives? And what became apparent to her was that the everyday experience of washing our children, doing our laundry, watering our gardens, was very different than the big engineering system that delivered that water. So she termed that big engineering, big systems, big reservoirs, um, big investment. And then our actual experience of where water is um, used and consumed is in the very everyday small details. And so it seemed that there's a bit of a contradiction here. So we've got this big water system that is designed on the assumption that we can continue to expand supply. And the big water system, if we turn the tap on, 
the water keeps running. So the, the, the message we get from the system is actually that water is endless. And now we kind of know that it's not. And the, engine, the water companies, the big engineers, are now turning around to everyday consumers and saying, stop wasting our water. You know, you're very wasteful. And that this is, in fact, perhaps a bit unfair and maybe not that helpful. Uh, so that there is this contradiction between what the technical system tells us and what we kind of know about environment and what we know about how we need to change our conservation, our consumption behaviour. And Zoe's work drew on work of a sociologist um, from Lancaster University, Elizabeth Shove, who wrote a book called Comfort, Cleanliness and Convenience. And she looked at inconspicuous consumption, um, so in contrast to conspicuous consumption, which might be buying a car or buying clothes or an iPod, something that has some kind of status attached to it, to the very, again, inconspicuous consumption of water resources, energy, things that are just the normal, invisible, unthought of um, things of everyday life that have vast environmental impacts but which really barely even register on our consciousness as we're consuming them. And so she pointed out that, or from her perspective, this focus on changing attitudes towards water in order to change behaviour was a bit kind of foolish because, in fact, most people don't even have an attitude towards water. Most people just use water as part of their daily experience of either it's very convenient to jump in the shower or very convenient to throw your clothes into the automatic washing machine um, or it's very comfortable to just stand there on a cold morning before a stressful day at work to um, have that lovely feeling of a warm shower running over you. Um, and that our cultures of cleanliness have now changed from what's required for basic hygiene into absurd ideas about needing to change our clothes every day, needing to have our houses spick and span, needing to use a whole lot of cleaning products and cosmetics that go along with that. So she pointed out there are a whole lot of kind of cultural issues that go along with how people consume these water and energy that just are kind of below the radar of these ideas that we need to convince people to just stop wasting water because the environment's at risk. So if we then think about water sustainability, essentially from the work of Elizabeth Shove and Zoe Sophoulis and others, I think it's fair enough to say that the environmental imperative alone will not deliver changes in everyday water consumption. Um, and so we need to have a better understanding of some of those everyday practices of consumption in order to better direct our water demand management campaigns. And also, I think, in order to better direct our design of infrastructure, our design of houses, our design of appliances. Um, and importantly, if we look, going back to what does this mean for those people who don't have access to 20 litres per person per day, is that probably this centralised model of infrastructure provision is not going to be universally transferable across the world. And if we don't, you know, if we take seriously these kind of stresses on water resources, it may not even be desirable to kind of translate this model of consumption and this model of water into other parts of the world. So what are the alternatives? We have um, alternatives to water provision acting across different scales. I have to say that one of the things I think we really need to look at, and this is the case in um, places like Africa where they're really trying to meet, or South Africa in particular, where they're really trying to meet those Millennium Development Goals for sanitation, is that um, waterless toilets and waterless sanitation techniques really need, really are central. Um, if we were to come, if you know, someone was to come from another planet, land on Earth, discover that we have such precious, well, that fresh water is such a precious resource for us, and then to discover that we, you know, deliver it to our houses, shit in it and flush it down the sewer, seems to me a really stupid thing to do. So that, for starters, is not a very smart model to transfer <coughs> elsewhere. And where possible, if we can actually start to think, you know, maybe not today or tomorrow, but certainly even in our own cities, is it possible to move away from that really insane, wasteful use of good, clean drinking water? So the next step, apart from trying to just eliminate water from some um, wasteful uses, is to then think about using water that's fit for purpose. 
So we treat in the UK 150 litres per person per day to drinking water standards. So it's basically pure, clean water. And then we only use about two or three litres of that for actual drinking or cooking purposes. So we're yeah, cleaning up all this water and then flushing it straight down the toilet. So what we might start to think about is, can we come up with alternative water, uh, water systems so that we're using water that's you know, still safe but not as clean as drinking water and that might be collected or recycled locally um, and can, use, can be used for flushing toilets, could be used for doing our laundry, could be used for um, watering our gardens. So some people already do that with their water butts, but expanding that idea um, out a bit further. Um, we can also look at recycling. So recycling, as I mentioned, water from our laundries and using that to flush toilets, for instance, and collecting rainwater locally. Um, either yeah, in so many, taking that rainwater butt example and making that a more engineered and more reliable system. And so that can happen on a household scale, but we can also do that on a neighbourhood scale. And this is an example um, of a housing development in the southeast of Queensland um, called Pimpa Macumara. That's the little Australian language test for you all today. Um, so in Pimpa Macumara, people have two sets of pipes in their houses. They have a purple pipe, which is for non-potable, non-drinking uses, and they have a blue pipe, which is for, you know, for drinking purposes only. And the water from that purple pipe comes from a local um, recycling and treatment unit, and it also comes from their own local um, household rainwater <coughs> tanks, rainwater collection. So these systems don't have to happen just on a household scale. They can happen at a neighbourhood scale. And in fact, that makes a bit more sense in terms of thinking about how that's managed. So as much as I care about water and sustainability, to be honest, I don't think I've got the time in my life to be running my own water treatment system in my basement. But if someone else, if I can pay someone else to either come into my house and do that, or if I can pay a local neighbourhood service provider who may or may not be my water company, I think possibly not, um, that there might be new um, room in our water systems for not just technologies but also businesses and institutions to run, to regulate, to manage those systems. Heading back again into um, the developing countries, and that's not my area of expertise, but we certainly have very strong researchers um, active in UCL on that. And so this is some work that Adriana Allen, Julio de Villa and others from the UCL Development Planning Unit looked at. So they did some work looking at the peri-urban um, interface, so the, that area between the urban and the rural, where a lot of informal settlement happens and a lot of the poorest people of the city live. And they found that these people really, even in cities where there are um, infrastructure, there is some sort of infrastructure provision, that these people really fall in between the cracks. And this is basic, so essentially because it's too expensive to provide water to them, private um, providers aren't interested because they can't make a profit out of it. So these people are kind of left outside um, the conventional um, provision, and yet they survive. They find, they use all sorts of strategies um, for gaining access to water. Some of them might connect illegally to the centralised system. Some of them um, pay private water vendors. Some of them borrow water from their neighbours who might have a connection. So there's a whole range of kind of... Um, some of them might also have rainwater harvesting systems. So there's a whole range of kind of systems and strategies that people use, but that these aren't recognised in the formal kind of policy or formal infrastructure systems. And part of the point of this is that instead of just pushing out this kind of centralised model and saying it's all or nothing, is to try and start with perhaps some of the strategies that people are using, formalise and support those with appropriate institutions, policies, technologies, and that that might be a way of getting in and providing water to those um, deprived people. So just to kind of sum up on what we're looking at in terms of these alternatives to the big water system. First of all, we do absolutely need to maintain that public health imperative. You know, it started from the right motivation and um, 
we are incredibly lucky that we're able to, um, to enjoy such good standards of public health in cities like London. But we need to recognise that that system that provided, um, that was designed on that basis and the technologies that developed up around that have then created a whole lot of behaviours that mean that we're consuming resources far beyond what's needed for public health. And so that these technologies of water provision have interacted with how people behave in their everyday lives to create these really high consuming cultures and lifestyles. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about is to really start to develop infrastructures and technologies that support the poorest people in meeting their public health needs and their everyday needs for water, rather than this kind of push of one particular centralised model of infrastructure. So it's likely that uh, these alternatives to big water will be a combination of on and off grid or a combination of centralised and decentralised. We're not saying let's rip out all of the water mains, we're saying let's look at wh what are the alternatives to do things on other scales, in many ways supported or underpinned possibly by a centralised system for delivering public health outcomes. Uh, and that that might then mean that there are a diverse set of providers of water and sanitation services, so someone who comes and services your composting toilet, a, a neighbourhood system that operates on circulating rainwater harvesting. These kinds of things that are likely to be different than a big water company with one bill for sewage and sanitation services. And coming back from this understanding of everyday water compared with the big engineering water is to actually start to involve users and communities in the design and the decision making about water infrastructure. So just to sum up, of course, sustainable systems have to meet basic human needs. They have to reduce wasteful consumption. They have to most likely operate across different scales. So everywhere from the very close, intimate scale of your bathroom up to the catchment scale in those, to try and reduce that regional water stress. And they need to allow for more local water cycles and water cultures. So possibly what we've got a bit too much of in water infrastructure provision at the moment is this 19th century model of large scale infrastructure provision and perhaps not enough that takes into account the very everyday, the very local needs of users uh, and developing those kind of cultures around more sustainable consumption. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, we do have time for about three or four questions. Um, so can I just ask if you can wait to ask your questions till myself or a colleague gets to you with the microphone? Um, I think there was one there. Hello. Oh, um, I was wondering if you would be supportive of a uh, revenue neutral water tax, essentially tax the use of water, tax the use of um, products which are very water intensive and then you know, all the revenue raised, rebated to the you know, taxpayers, essentially their overall income stays the same, but the relative price of water and water intensive products goes up. The relative value of um, water efficient technology also increases. Um, I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's where um, it's not necessarily a, an issue of tax as just basic water tariffs and water, um, well, certainly in this country and almost everywhere, is underpriced. So, um, for instance, the regulator of the water, so England and Wales have the only fully pri privatised water industry in the world. Um, and so there are private companies that are regulated by an economic regulator. Last year, the economic regulator, um, wanting to keep consumers, you know, prices, greater than inflation. So actually, increases in water prices in the UK over the next few years are going to be less than inflation. So real price of water is going down, which then means that companies like Thames Water will have to scrap big investment programs like replacing water mains, replacing water leaks uh, in London. So it is, um, and, and so I think that in this country, 
regulation of water prices to keep them very low, which is a very kind of politically um, popular thing to do, really undermines the sustainable the investment in sustainable infrastructure because there's just not the money to invest in, um, in capital projects and sustainability. So, yeah, it's not necessarily, you don't have to go down the kind of route of taxation, you just need to get water pricing right. At the moment, you know, I'm, I'm sure people from Thames Water would say that we're not even pricing water at a reasonably, at, at a level that's sustainable in terms of maintaining our infrastructure, never mind anything like taking into account environmental impacts or other kind of um, externalities that might be included. Just a comment on that before I give my question is that, of course, sorry, um, that um, because the industry is privatised, it has to produce a profit. Um, whereas if it were, as it used to be with water authorities, uh, they didn't produce profits. Um, so more water would go back to sustaining the system. So I have to put a question mark over whether privatisation is actually the best route to go down. But that was my question. That was, you were talking about local systems, and on your diagram you had local water treatment. And one reason, presumably, why we have large centralised plants is because it's a great deal cheaper to have one big plant than a thousand little plants scattered around the country. And that would be more energy consuming, more carbon dioxide, and more expensive. So surely, using that sort of system you showed there doesn't make sense unless you've got a very small community, which is a long way from anywhere. Yeah, I think the calculations, I think the calculations are out on that one. So it does, I think it does depend on scale, and there is data around at the moment to show that actually rainwater harvesting on a household scale is more carbon intensive than delivering water from a centralised water treatment system. Um, but the, these technologies are relatively um, new and so there are improvements to be made in pumping efficiency of those smaller scale systems. And also I think that the calculations haven't really been done on the kind of intermediate scale. So I think there probably is a halfway house there in between um, the, you know, every single person having their own pump and doing it on a neighbourhood scale. So I think that optimisation, I haven't seen it being done yet and I think it still does remain to be seen. So yeah, there is, I, I, we should definitely not assume that small scale is more sustainable because certainly doing it on a plot level, often it's not. Um, but, so, so it does, the optimisation needs to be done on a spatial scale, it also needs to be done on a number of different indicators, so it's not just um, carbon. We also do need to consider kind of water efficiency as well and, um, you know, other indicators along the way. So, yeah, it's not necessarily, and, and so this is why I would say it needs to have, we're looking at operating across scales and that there's probably an optimum of different technologies at different scales and different kind of um, criteria to do that optimisation on. Um, thanks very much, and that's all uh, the time we've got for questions. Um, firstly, if I can ask everyone to just fill in their evaluation forms, and secondly, if you can join me in thanking Sarah Bell. <laughs>